can start. Uh, if they yes, close the door. All right. Uh, it's a uh, uh, more than a privilege, more than an honor for me to chair my long-term uh, most uh, beloved, most respected colleague, uh, Professor Ayşe Gül Yüksel, who is actually, who has been actually uh, a public instructor uh, of the theater for the Turkish people because she's been writing in the uh, most respected Turkish daily, Cumhuriyet, for over nearly 40 years. Nearly. And uh, I was telling her that, uh, you know, you have been an instructor on the theater to the Turkish people because your uh, criticism of plays, your, uh, uh, you know, columns in the Jumhuriyet have been a kind of public uh, school for people about the theater. So uh, it's indeed, uh, for this uh, conference, uh, uh, a wonderful uh, opportunity, especially for young people, uh, to hear after uh, our uh, uh, great colleague Susanna, uh, her wonderful paper, another, I am sure, wonderful paper on uh, theatre in England. Uh, first, let me just summarize her. Uh, uh, extensive uh, uh, CV. Uh, um, Professor Yüksel is an Istanbul girl. Uh, she studied at uh, Istanbul University and then uh, got her MA from New York University. These are of course great uh, uh, castles of uh, scholarship and the, uh, as a Fulbright grant, uh, grantee she had a Fulbright scholarship and then uh, her uh, PhD from Ankara University. Imagine Istanbul University, New York University, Ankara University. And also her, uh, in her career, she has taught at uh, distinguished universities, beginning with uh, Middle East Technical University, and then on to Ankara University, where she was uh, in the Department of English Language and Literature, and also uh, concurrently uh, in the department of uh, drama or the theatre, and the uh, uh, so uh, she also uh, has taught at Hacettepe University at Atılım here, of course. I, I saw her uh, students coming and giving her a big hug, and also at our university, at Başkent University. So she is, in fact, a uh, great scholar a great teacher and indeed a wonderful colleague. The, uh, her uh, writings are enormous, so I am not going to uh, uh, tell you what they are, but at least you must remember that she wrote, uh, she has written nine books uh, on theater and drama, and her most recent book uh, came out this August, it's called in Turkish Yüzyılların Sahne Büyücüsü William Shakespeare. That is the stage magician of centuries, William Shakespeare. Of course, Shakespeare has always been her uh, great passion uh, in her academic life. Of course, it doesn't mean that uh, it's only Shakespeare. Of course, complete English drama from the Middle Ages to the, uh, to the present. And therefore, uh, her papers, of course, uh, is again extensive, uh, talking about uh, uh, theatre in the Middle Ages and in Renaissance England. The title is The Ironical Position of Theatre in Medieval and Renaissance England. So, uh, the, uh, of course, initiating title is interesting, reinforcing or defying authority, question mark. Uh, it sort of clicks up something in your mind uh, uh, also uh, today in Turkey. Do we reinforce uh, authority or do we defy authority? That's of course a question 
uh, as Hamlet would say. Uh, okay, so um, uh, the uh, uh, I mean uh, I can't uh, uh, come to a conclusion, but I will leave it to you. So, <laughs> Thank you, Professor uh, Umut. Yes. Uh, Susanna must understand that he has always been very generous with his compliments. No, <laughs> it's true, yes. <laughs> it's so nice to be here. I thank the organizers of this beautiful conference for giving me the privilege of being here with you. 20 years is a very long time uh, especially when I remember that 20 years earlier I was much younger. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a great pleasure to see former students as staff members now of Atulum University as well as other universities. I can count about 20 or 25 at one glimpse. So thank you for being here. I'm not going to say something original about the theater. <laughs> As Professor Umut uh, suggested, whether the authority tries to shape and crush theater, whether it has been the uh, task of authority to use theater, to employ theater as a device in propagating its own principles, or at the same time controlling theater, trying, holding it within the grasp of authority, has been, you know, an event uh, throughout history. We all know that it was so at the time of ancient Greece, and I wanted to look at the position of theater in medieval and Renaissance England from that point of view. Was there pressure from authority or was theater completely free? Now we understand that. I say we understand because popular history of theater tells us that drama in, the, in England started in the late 10th century uh, uh, in the form of liturgical drama in the church. There are certain medievalists who oppose this idea. They believe that there must have been a much more uh, greater tradition than just liturgical drama in the church to bring together this awful <laughs> canon of uh, English drama that we have today. But that point is still the subject of inquiry and research because much has been lost. So again, what is left, what we know for sure is that Medieval, the medieval start in English drama was somehow under the control and the authority <coughs> of the church. We understand that it began as a part of the Easter service and it was a four line play. Three women, three Marys, come to the tomb of Christ and an angel faces them. The angel asks, what are you doing, you women? And they say, we have come for Christ. And the angel replies, he's no longer here. He's not in his tomb. He is risen. Go and tell people, tell everybody that he is risen. Just imagine 
a simple church service, and then this great theatrical uh, spectacle with four actors, priests, saying their lines in Latin, and the choir boys providing uh, music. A kind of very early opera, if you want. And the audience was amazed, of course. Not only amazed because of the content of the lines, but because of the form of presentation. That's the point where religious ritual and artistic, the artistry of the theater comes together. It became immediately popular, and the church liked it very much because the magnificence of the atmosphere, of the spectacle, also filled the people with religious feelings, although they didn't understand Latin at all. Very soon, when the theater developed more as artistic innovation, uh, of course, religion was being laid aside. Therefore, the authorities moved it out into the churchyard, and then soon, when I'm saying soon, I'm talking about years and centuries, of course, uh, moved into the marketplace where it was taken over by the trade guilds, which were an important group of people in medieval England. I must read on a little bit because I will never be able to finish. <laughs> up to that point in the play, up to that point in the history of English drama, theater's function was to reinforce the authority of the church. But when it moved into the marketplace, to begin with, it began to be practiced in vernacular, everyday language. So it became a part of the people. People enjoyed it. And then mysteries, the kinds of religious plays called mysteries, presenting scenes from the Bible, and miracles presenting scenes from the lives of saints developed in time. This brings us to the late 14th century, when the great mystery cycles of uh, many cities, including York, Chester, Coventry, and Wakefield, uh, were included. It was the responsibility of the trade guild to make the best of the dramatic spectacles. Uh, and many tradesmen, many craftsmen, knew Latin, and they were also quite good writers of poetry. Unfortunately, we cannot mention names because all the plays written up to the end of the medieval period were anonymous. They had no signatures. And these trade guildsmen were also rich. So they could put a lot of money. They could put, put a lot of, uh, of their workers, of their apprentices, into the production of the spectacle spectacle and scenic effects, which means that going into the marketplace, theater was gradually moved towards, moving towards autonomy. It was becoming an autonomous art, although the themes were religious. Corpus Christi festivals are especially important among such uh, productions. They were instituted to honor Jesus in the sacrament of the Last Supper and 
such festivities were extremely uh, popular. According to the church calendar, uh, they are observed 60 days after Easter, more or less from May 21 to June 24. So it's springtime and almost summertime. Well, not in England, springtime in England. <laughs> <laughs> Now, one of, one of uh, the medievalists, Martin Brown, gives us an imaginary, but an imagined, also, but also an imaginative picture of a Corpus Christi festival taken out, taken out of the 14th century uh, rituals in the city of York. So let's all go back to the 14th century, to the city of York. The mystery plays are going to be performed. It's very early in the morning. I'm repeating you. It's very early in the morning. And throughout the whole day, 48 episodes will be played in 12 different stations in the city, mostly city squares. And in those 48 scenes or episodes, we will be watching the history of life, the history of creation, the history of life up to the judgment day. Almost all of the members of the city are uh, included in the production because these uh, festivities are going to take place on pageant wagons. Some one story, big carts, some two story hard. The first wagon, uh, wagon will go to the first meeting place. Uh, the episode will be presented, then the next will come, and the next will come. And uh, the, the show, let's call it the show, it will start at 4.30 in the morning and end at dusk. And it will be lighted with torches. A beautiful day, and obviously not a beautifully religious day, but a day of beautiful entertainment for the people. He gives us examples. Uh, first, God appears, he's alone in the world, then he creates the bands of angels, then he creates in different episodes uh, Lucifer. But Lucifer is not a nice angel. He wants to take God's place. Therefore, he has to be punished. This episode takes place on a two-story wagon. The heaven is in the upper part and hell is beneath. Now, how do you teach Lucifer and his followers out of heaven into hell. Well, there was a nice trapdoor in the very middle, and down the trapdoor door went, uh, went Lucifer and his sinister followers into uh, hell. Now, this, this was a beautiful kind of uh, artistry. Anyway, Lucifer was made painted uh, in a fearful manner. Satan was, of course, whenever he appeared, uh, looked awful. And the history of the world went on like that. Only the stock characters from the Bible wore special uh, costumes, including uh, God, but all the other citizens were wearing their everyday clothes 
and speaking in their own language. So we understand that theater had already become an, an asset for the people. They were creating their own theater. Religion was still respected because we all know that medieval times uh, are religious times. But the, uh, the craft of the theater was in, increasing all the time. For example, there was a competition between trade guilds. And the specialists in certain trade guilds were given certain chores. For example, the shipbuilders, I wonder whether this is, I don't think this would be in York anyway, the, the shipbuilders were given the episode of Noah's Ark, because the people are going to get on the ship. Uh, the goldsmiths were given the chore of uh, the episodes in which kings want gifts, rich gifts. Most strikingly, the carpenters were given the chore of nailing Christ to the cross. And just imagine, every tradesman wanted to show off uh, with his own craft and turn it into an artistic piece. The competition grew, and of course, the popularity of the uh, plays were also growing. Therefore, by the end of the medieval period, the theater was beginning to assert itself as an autonomous art aiming at instructing and entertaining spectators. At, in those days, the word spectator was more popular than the word audience. The audience will appear in uh, Renaissance time. Okay, what is ironical about, about all this? The irony is that it was, theater was used as a device, as a tool of the teaching of the Catholic faith to the people, and it ended up remaining religious, but at the same time becoming an independent art of its own. And from that time on, the church <coughs> had no control over theater at all. This was the first part of my... Am I? Taking too much of our time. Oh, yes. I move on to the second part now. Okay. Okay. Just quarter to one. Mm -hmm. we got okay. Minutes, yeah. okay. The Renaissance, when we move into the Renaissance and the time of monarchy, uh, we find a different situation. The rule of Elizabeth I also marks the time of the English Renaissance, during which all remnants and the time of Reformation, in which all remnants of the Catholic faith went through a process of being crushed by the new Protestant uh, creed. And at that moment, Clifford Davidson took support that a good number of medieval texts were dis destroyed because they were considered to be dangerously papist under the pressure from the Protestant authorities. It was a time when the stained glass of some of the churches in England were pulled down and because they somehow implied the Catholic faith and they were replaced by plain glass. <coughs> it's obvious that such texts would have been destroyed. At 
the same time, the codes of the monarchic state were being established. So the monarchy, we're no longer in the feudal age, uh, the monarchy had its own codes. Therefore, in the Renaissance, the church was no longer the authority. The state had overtaken the power of authority. And from that time on, there would be a delicate balance between the state as authority and theater, because theater was changing. Because now it was time for professional, commercial, secular theater to appear. In his book, Shakespeare's Freedom, Greenblatt points out that the playing companies profited from the deliberate strangulation of medieval theatrical rituals that had been too closely linked to the festival calendar of the outlawed, outlawed <coughs> Catholic Church. In his book, Will of the World, however, Greenblatt reminds us that because the mystery cycles in Corpus Christi pageants were not strictly Catholic, they lingered on into 1570s and 80s, uh, and therefore, they could be seen by people in Elizabeth's reign, during Elizabeth's reign. Moralities were also popular at the time. It follows that in his childhood, most probably, Shakespeare, being the son of Stratford's bailiff, was a spectator in such festivities. So there's a bond between the Renaissance playwrights who sign their names under their works and the previous medieval tradition that somehow lingered on. Another point of difference, of course, was that in medieval times, all theater people were amateurs. Now, professional theater was going to start. That is, they were producing theater for profit. Montrose gives us a nice idea by pointing out that Shakespeare marks this cultural conjuncture in uh, his play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, by juxtaposing his own play, which is a <coughs> play of pre-modern times, uh, which is written for professional theaters, against the comic meta-dramatizing of Bottom the Weaver, and other trade guildsmen in their process of producing an amateurish theatrical spectacle within the body of the professional play. So uh, he's mostly saying, look, we are this kind of theater, but also there was and there has been this kind of theater in our tradition as well. Elizabeth's time of the Renaissance was an era of national growth, commercial activity, geographical expansion, and international economic relations, as well as one of growing interest in knowledge and culture. Therefore, besides wiping out the remaining traces of Catholicism, the state as authority aimed at a strong structuring of the monarchic system so as to control political, social, and economic factors all at once. And there was a hierarchy. Within the Elizabethan society, relationship of authority and dependency, of desire and fear, 
were characteristic of both the public and the domestic domains. Domestic relations between husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and servants were habitually politicized. The household, the family, was a microcosm of the state. Within this framework, secular, commercial, professional theater would be a convenient device in establishing the desired values in pre-modern England. It followed that theater was once again to be employed as a tool in reinforcing the will of authority. The rise of secular professional theater begins with Elizabeth's licensing in 1574 of the Earl of Leicester's company run by James Burbage, Richard Burbage's father, and four other partners of his to play plays for the recreation of our loving subjects. So, you see, we have this uh, divorce uh, from religious teaching. The founders of this kind of theater were middle class craftsmen, yet they were different from the devoted trade guildsmen of medieval times because they were the products of England, new phase of capitalistic innovations and global expansion. Therefore, public theaters that opened for business in the 1570s were financed by the capital of <coughs> prosperous London merchants. They were more or less protected by the elite, by the gentility, but the money came from merchants. They were controlled by the state, but they also belonged to the people. So, for the playwright, finding a balance between the desires of the audience and the will of the state was an important uh, problem. <coughs> this theatrical world picture which was altogether different from that in medieval times, was strengthened by an innovation in the art of the actor. In this new age, characterization, both in writing and in uh, interpreting the role, started. We call it but they call it personation, which we now call individual characterization. The stock character types of medieval drama were too simple for the ambitious actor. His new task was to interpret the multidimensional characteristics of Hamlet, Othello, Lear, and the like. And playwrights wrote long soliloquies for such new stage individuals. So, not only the ticket play payer, but also the authorities would get easily carried away by the performance of the actor and perhaps fail to notice that the actor or the playwright was trespassing the limits of the social political framework imposed by the cause of the states. Now the actor's magic was something more powerful than the power of the state because hundreds and thousands of people were applauding uh, the performances. Therefore, <coughs> the moral requirement of the theater faded as the commercial incentive grew. <coughs> And now theater had a power, a special power of its own. And the state was both tolerating theater because it was so popular, and at the same time it was limiting it. Lots of people went to prison and 
Janus Shapiro tells us that Shakespeare was the only playwright that kept out of prison throughout his career. That's what he tells us. I don't know. Okay. <coughs> now, the representation of Elizabethan system of domestic and social relations based upon hierarchical distinctions of gender, generation, and rank was significantly different in theater than what was presented in <coughs> state homilies, state preachings, and handbooks on marriage and domestic conduct. So theater was doing something different from what the authority uh, imposed upon it. And I have a few examples of how Shakespeare more or less kept out of prison by still defying, defying uh, the norms of the monarchic state, which he criticized very often. Okay. For example, uh, in a Midsummer Night's Dream again, the authority of kings over their subjects and that of fathers over children have been defied, have been upset, because after all, Hermia, our young girl, turns out uh, to choose Lysander and manages to get married to Lysander. A further way of upsetting the norms of male-dominated society was changing the position of women from that of a sexless object of desire and that of a silenced wife to a human being who expects to be loved properly. In an age when marrying for love was fairly, now, fairly new, Shakespeare's creation of the loving couple in Much Ado About Nothing, remember, Benedict and Beatrice. Uh, it upset the socially accepted direction of desire. In As You Like It, you would also remember, Rosalind teaches her loved one, Orlando, to the art of wooing, because she wants to be wooed properly, because she, uh, before she says yes to his proposal of marriage. And you will remember that in The Merchant of Venice, Portia, by her tricks, secures the lifelong loyalty of her husband, which were uh, absolutely outside the scope of uh, the monarchic understanding of Elizabeth's time. The hierarchy in social ranks are also implicitly disturbed. Uh, for example, in Much Ado About Nothing, simple townspeople like Dogberry and Vergus are glorified as decent citizens, while Don John of Gentility and his followers are condemned for neighbor. Because the whole story develops according to the way the monarchy would have liked it to develop, these implied uh, points pass unnoticed, especially when blurred by the artistic power of the artists. <coughs> Shakespeare was an artist who favored the idea of a strong monarchy, but Greenblatt puts forth that he was allergic to the absolutist strain that prevailed in the world he lived in. His most effective weapon in defying this absolutist attitude was historification. His social and political criticism of his time is best engraved in the following lines from Hamlet, to be or not soliloquy. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the law's delay, 
the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. All of that implicitly referred to the here and the now of Elizabeth's England. And the audience share enjoyed sharing the power of social criticism generated on the stage by their playwright. The protest expressed in those lines would hardly pass unnoticed by the authorities. Yet, these were lines from a great play with Richard Burditch, the top tragic actor of the time, playing the leading role. And this was one of the moments when the power of the theatrical act was felt most profoundly. The authorities kept quiet. After all, all that happened in the play had taken place in the medieval past in a distant country called Denmark. So in spite, I'm finishing, in spite of all the efforts of the authority for <coughs> limiting the art of the theater, there was, after all, a social agreement, a willingness on the part of the elite to permit the artist's freedom to exist. Line nine, we remember, of Sonnet 66, which runs as art made tongue-tied by authority, must have also been tolerated in terms of such a social agreement. Okay, my concluding statement comes from Louis Montrose, who says, it was beyond the capacity of the Elizabethan state to achieve the uniform and absolute limitation of alternative and oppositional discourses of the theater. He adds that such control is as yet beyond the power of any state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Yüksel, uh, for this uh, uh, <laughs> broader perspective of uh, the development of uh, theatre from a uh, politically controlled or uh, ideologically controlled institution uh, under the church and then under the uh, civil authority into an independent and the um, autonomous uh, uh, establishment uh, criticizing and in a sense uh, um, dissociate, disassociating itself from uh, authority and so uh, I'm sure uh, there are comments or questions from the floor. Yes, Professor Bozer. Thank you very much. Ayşegül thank you very much for your wonderful paper. Um, it made me think of so many things uh, related to Turkey uh, today. Uh, and, uh, of course, the theater as an aesthetic tool of dissent uh, can only fulfill its function as a voice of dissent. Otherwise, I mean, uh, uh, what would it be its function? Uh, than just affirming uh, the ideology of the state, or in this case, the church. Uh, but also, uh, one of the significant things, of course, uh, significant institutions uh, of uh, the Renaissance was uh, patrons. Uh, because, not just because of the state, but the patrons who were uh, at times representatives of certain ideologies, um, disabled writers to really voice their uh, opinion on certain issues. And like you said, of course, they resorted to uh, historicization uh, at the time. Uh, what's, I, I want to go back again to the, the situation in Turkey and compare it with the Arts Council in uh, England at the time. Uh, I mean, is uh, I know you have written so much on this, and you are very knowledgeable. Um, do you do you really think that uh, the state, uh, I mean, the theater, can be independent by um, 
receiving money from the state or uh, from an art council or in the case of uh, in the Renaissance a patron well uh, I believe that if you're talking about today uh, I believe that throughout the world especially in cultures where theater has been owned by the people uh, the state has to provide financial support because it's a theater is a very expensive art. Uh, that's why the art council has been operating so beautifully, and that's why I think the Turkish theaters should also receive a good amount of financing from the state. Would that answer your question? Oh, yes, partly. But of course, the, uh, the directors and the actors have to, like you mentioned in your paper, the actors change uh, certain things in the Renaissance, not just in relation to acting, but uh, also in, in their interpretation, let's say, of mm -hmm. the text. So uh, that would be a way of uh, distancing yourself from um, the, the oppression, should I say, of uh, authority. It, today, of course, it, the political situation in Renaissance England uh, was both, uh, in a sense, trying to impose Protestantism on pe people, a very serious thing, plus establishing the rules of the monarchy. Today, in today's Turkey, if you want, uh, that's why they were so observe, uh, uh, interested in the ways of the theater. In today's Turkey, people are no longer interested in the ways of theater. They just want uh, theater to remain a simple kind of entertainment, you know, uh, so that people can spend their leisure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a great difference. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Uh, now I have, uh, if there are no comments or questions, uh, I've been asked to make two. And just, just a tiny comment, if I may. Thank you very much for this beautiful paper. Uh, again, coming back to uh, various hierarchies and control mechanisms. Uh, I'm no specialist in the field, first of all, but I'm just making some observations from the, uh, as a medievalist. When we take a look at who was sponsoring and staging these plays in the Middle Ages, it is the guilds. The guilds were also a rising power force. So they were also resisting some of the authorities and perhaps because of that, there was a gradual development, evolution towards uh, Elizabethan drama and the, the coming more, more, more of independence and acting. Although we do not have any names, uh, any specific names, but they were also forcing the boundaries and limits of control. For example, the Wakefield master, although we don't know uh, who he is, he, uh, we can identify we hope to identify him according to some of the stylistic qualities. There are various uh, parts in his plays going against authorities, allowing more liberty, and uh, because although there was sponsorship, the sponsors are not rigidly placed in the feudal hierarchy. They are they could say things, they they could do things against uh, the feudal lords or again against church and uh, one of the very very typical common uh, example is the sh second shepherd's play where there's quite a big argument about what is immoral what is amoral uh, and how uh, certain things are being imposed so what would you think about the guilds being the sponsored the sponsors of uh, drama, basically, in late 14th, 15th century. Now, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the guilds had their own discipline. Uh, 
uh, they were sponsoring, of course, these shows, but they expected great discipline from all the contributors. Uh, the defiance here, we find here, is purely artistic. Otherwise, there was no, uh, there were no irreligious attitudes. Although, uh, late in the 14th century, perhaps, you know, folk minstrels and people, you know, who had their shows in the marketplace, in fairs, were also called upon for better uh, spectacles. But obviously, uh, the discipline was there. Otherwise, the whole thing would not have gone on for centuries in, in such a strict manner. But theater itself is naughty. <laughs> By nailing uh, Christ to the cross, we, we can imagine what those carpenters, the actors who were acting as carpenters, uh, did. They created their own enjoyment in the midst of religious fervor in the midst of uh, suffering, in the midst of getting lost in a tragedy, in a tragic way. But theater always has its way of escape. That was what I was trying to pinpoint while I was talking about the Corpus Christi festivities. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, uh, because of the delay at the start, um, the next session will be, uh, has been removed to the after lunch, the first, it will be the first session. So uh, that session, uh, Professor uh, Oya Mentes' uh, talk will be chaired by uh, Professor Eifer Altai. And now, uh, you know, when we look at the program, it is 12, 15, 14 hours as the lunch time. That's a leisurely time. But now we are short of time, so we'll have a quick lunch and be back here at 2 o'clock uh, sharp. And so the first session uh, will be Professor Mentish's talk. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Morning, we've had two uh, extensively studied and prepared papers, and the, this will go on in the afternoon, I'm sure. So don't go away, come back. <laughs> uh, just before you